But putting that aside, because it's very difficult to quantify publication bias, um, if you look at the meta-analyses, the overviews of all the trials, you can even select your own particular overview, which comes out a little bit your way. But if you take the overview of the overviews, then the meta -meta -analysis. a meta-meta-analysis, uh, then there is no effect. And here I'm not talking about any work I've done, but I would refer you to Professor Ed Sardern, so the Peninsula University is the professor of complementary and alternative medicine. And um, I uh, bow to his special knowledge. But beyond that, two years ago in The Lancet, there was a very interesting look at this uh, question. And that showed, with huge statistical st significance, the smaller the trial, the more likely homeopathy was to be positive. The bigger the trial, the more likely it would be shown to have a negative, a, a zero effect. Uh, and as distinct from matching trials of um, scientific medicine, where the bigger the trial, the bigger the result. So you, you, you get this distinction where things really work, the bigger the trial, the more likely you are to show them. Where things don't work or are at the borderline working, by random effect alone, you can see a suggestion of something working. Of course, uh, it will be the other way as well. And you can then accentuate the positive. So if you really, really want to believe in something which, to my mind, is utterly irrational, such as homeopathy, then by all means be very selective in the trials you use and which particular overview of which trials you use. That is very interesting. So it, it really ties in with some of the other things we've been looking at in sort of paranormal um, e evidence. You get a sort of slight suggestion there might be something there, but it's very, very difficult to pin down, and it kind of disappears. The more hard you look at it, the more evidence you gather, yes. the more the apparent effect just vanishes like a puff of air. And, mm. and you're saying the same thing with respect to these trials. That is very interesting. Well, when I was a young lad, a hypersensitive young lad, I could always see ghosts out the corner of my indeed. eye in my bedroom. I yes. turned, they were never there. Yes, indeed, that's, that's right. Mm. Now, um, you, you, you said that homeopathy is extremely implausible, and I, I, I think that's, that's right. And let's just reiterate why it's implausible. It, I suppose it's implausible because of the extreme dilutions of the substances, the, the allegedly active substances. More than that, they actually say that the more dilute it is, the more potent it is. And the dilutions we're talking about are way beyond where there's going to be any molecule at all hmm. in, the, in the bottle of substance which the patient is, is given. So um, that, that means that, that we really do demand much stronger evidence than, than one would, no would normally expect, I suppose. And, and, and yes. we, don't, we clearly don't get it. But clinical trials, as you say, there's only finite resources to do clinical trials. And so um, experimental doctors don't want to waste their time testing something that ha seems to have very little intrinsic plausibility. I wonder though whether physicists could be called in to do tests, nothing to do with testing patients, but just to see whether there is any way, using any instrument you like, to detect a difference between water that once had a little tiny drop of common salt, for example, which is one of the things that they, that they use, mm. and water that doesn't, bearing in mind that in the case of common salt, every molecule of water in the world has been in touch with common salt, because every molecule of water obviously is recycled into the sea and, and out again. So we're talking about a, a control bottle which contains water which has been in contact with common salt in the sea, an experimental bottle which has been in contact with with the, with the sea, with molecules in, in the sea, plus one little tiny extra drop, and there's no molecule left from that. Mm. That is why it's so incredibly implausible. But do you think it would be worthwhile, leaving aside clinical trials, to actually once and for all nail this by challenging physicists to find any difference at all between mm. these substances? Not necessarily chemical difference, some kind mm. of physical difference. Well, um, I have three parts. Uh, in answer, the components. Just again to illustrate the implausibility, it has been said that uh, every molecule of water in the, in the universe has once been in contact with a molecule 
of the urine of Julius Caesar. Yes. I mean, uh, that's uh, uh, no exaggeration how utterly implausible it is. B, uh, it's quite difficult to design such an experimental study. Um, I'm not a physicist, but as I understand, there have been attempts in the past, but by all means uh, allow a team of physicists to see if they can identify a new law of physics, because we would then have to um, advocate rewriting the laws of physics. And then, finally, I still think we're wasting our time, because we're not dealing with a hypothesis that you are testing, which is the nature of science. We're dealing with a belief system, and you can't put on trial a belief system. So I suspect, however often we get negative results, again and again and again, nothing will shift the belief system of a born-again homeopathist. That may be true, but they are, it's a very lucrative belief system. Um, millions, possibly billions of pounds are, are made on it. And people pay money, pay good money mm -hmm. to have this done. I should have thought that under those circumstances, although you may not shake a dyed in the wool homeopath, if one could publicize the fact that no physicist in the world was able to find any difference, indeed no the clinician was able to find any difference between these really truly properly prepared samples of substances. Mm. Um, that ought to, to shake the beliefs of enough people they would stop handing over good money to these people. Uh, I do not share your optimism there, but uh, it is a point of view. The, the first thing I want to say is um, I think the majority of homeopathic practitioners are decent folk. So do I. Uh, they're not crooks. In fact, a lot of them owe their success, not to the homeopathy, but to the fact they are decent people. They have time, they're compassionate, they look the patient in the eye, they talk to someone for an hour. These are nice people. I would like to recruit these really nice people to practice proper medicine. And it's so important, this looking the patient in the eye, having time to, to look after the patient, yeah. to take a detailed interest in the individual patient. I mean, no wonder they get good results given yes. that time. And we should learn from that, not to promote uh, irrational beliefs, but to understand the importance of good communication skills and empathy. Uh, and then, in the end, what we've got are proper doctors, empathetic doctors, kind doctors, skilled doctors, who will, in addition to the placebo effect of being that kind of physician, they can also add in truly effective drugs. And that, that's my vision of the future of the medical uh, profession. But I do not believe, or it may take a hundred years, to undermine such an irrational belief system at a time when the very values of the Age of Enlightenment are being challenged and more and more people are um, believing more and more irrational things. It's not a good time in the history of uh, the human race uh, to challenge one out of a myriad of irrational belief systems. Yes, there I, there I go along with your, with your pessimism. Um, homeopathy has been around a long time, of course, and, and, and um, seems to show great robustness. Um, one of the reasons why it may have been successful, I suppose, is that since it does absolutely nothing at all, and in earlier times when orthodox medicine positively harmed people by bloodletting and things, that again gave it a, a good start, I, yeah. I, I suppose. Let me draw your attention to a painting in the National Gallery which really says that. Um, Hogarth's series, Marriage à la Mode, fabulous. The very last painting shows the dying woman and in the background a doctor and a quack fighting each other, uh, blaming each other for the death of this woman. And what's so amusing is they were both equally useless. Yes, yes. Uh, and so at a time when the, um, the, the proper doctor, we're talking now uh, two, 250 years ago, uh, the proper doctor and the apothecary, they were both equally useless. And what they did was positively dangerous. Someone came along and gave nothing. That's an advance. Exactly. So the very the success yes. of homeopathy at its invention was simply because it did no harm, prima non nocere, mm. and we should never forget that. Mm. 